Shalom, everyone. Uh, I wanted to take a moment and make this video uh, to talk about an important topic that I've been interested in lately, and that is the question of whether or not the book of First Enoch should be considered inspired scripture. Now, uh, I recently participated in a debate concerning this question, and in this debate, I argued that First Enoch should not be considered inspired scripture. There is actually a link, if you want to watch this debate, there's a link to it in the description in the video below, if you're interested in checking it out. Uh, but in this video, I wanted to kind of go through the points that I raised in the debate, and I want to unpack them a little bit more. Uh, you know, due to, uh, if, if you're familiar with debates, if you watch a lot of them, or if you participated in any debates, uh, due to the time constraints uh, of debates, there's really not a lot of time, there's not enough time to really unpack all the information that you'd like to unpack. And so that was the case with the debate. I mean, I, I think that I did a pretty good job in the debate, uh, and I think I'm happy to let it stand the way that it is, and, and you guys can watch it and judge for yourself. Uh, but there, nevertheless, there is still a lot of information that I wasn't able to get to, hence this video. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through uh, my arguments, some of the arguments that I gave in the debate for why I believe that First Enoch should not be considered inspired scripture. And then I'm going to give a little bit more information on the points that I raised. And what I'd like to do from there is I'd like to also address a couple of the arguments in favor of uh, First Enoch being considered inspired scripture. So let's begin. Uh, there are, surprisingly, uh, you, and you probably already know this if you're watching this video, there are many believers today that think First Enoch should be considered scripture and therefore part of the Bible. Most Christians, like me, uh, disagree with that idea, but it's important to know why we disagree. These discussions and these debates are worth having. Uh, these issues are worth thinking about. And the reason is that the truth matters. We all should desire to know the truth. So, in regard to the truth, this is what it all comes down to. God has chosen to reveal the truth to us through sacred writings. In other words, he has inspired men throughout history to transmit his divine revelation about who he is, who we are, and how we relate to him. And that revelation from God is in the form of what we call scripture. So, the question of which writings make up inspired scripture is important because it has a direct impact on what we believe about God and our role as his people. The question of whether we should consider First Enoch as scripture is important because it has an impact on our theology. So, for example, if you aren't a Mormon, you agree with me that the Book of Mormon is not inspired. It does not give us the truth about God. Therefore, it is not a reliable source for theology. We want to get our theology, that is, our beliefs about God, our study of God, who he is, who we are, and our role in creation. We want to get our theology from sources that are actually inspired by God. Now, having said that, I want to say at the outset that I actually really do like and enjoy the book of First Enoch. I think it's a fascinating collection of Jewish writings, and it gives us valuable insight into the Judaisms of the Second Temple era. First Enoch uh, gives us some fascinating historical context into what different Jewish groups believed at the time, uh, the debates that the different Judaisms of that era had, and some of the beliefs being discussed, some beliefs shared among many of these different expressions of Jewish faith, and uh, many differences as well. So I, I think that's all important, and First Enoch is a valuable primary source that gives us insight into those types of things. However, I do not consider First Enoch to be inspired scripture like I consider Daniel, Jeremiah, or Isaiah to be inspired scripture. Uh, contrary to what is claimed by the book of Enoch, uh, we know that the patriarch Enoch in the Bible did not write First Enoch. 
There's no legitimate scholar that disputes that. Everyone agrees that the book uh, that we call First Enoch was composed by multiple authors and pieced together over the last few centuries BC, obviously long after the time of Enoch. The only people, no scholar disputes that, the only people that dispute that are people on the internet or people who want to believe that Enoch actually wrote it, and, and so they make that argument. But, uh, well, you know, well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that a little bit, uh, why it is that Enoch could not have written First Enoch. Uh, because this was a point that I threw out during the debate I had, but I didn't really have time to talk about it, and it wasn't really brought up. Um, but there are a few reasons we know that First Enoch wasn't written by the actual Enoch of the Bible, the first reason is that the writings contain anachronisms. Uh, for instance, uh, here are a couple of examples. Mount Sinai is mentioned by name in 1 Enoch 1.4, which obviously came way after Enoch, after Noah's flood. 1 Enoch 6.6 6 mentions Mount Hermon by name, uh, which also came way later after Noah's flood. So Enoch, of course, wouldn't have had any knowledge of these mountains. He was before the flood. Uh, and if you take the view that the flood was global, you know, like a lot of believers do, then you know that could have drastically changed the landscape of the earth, and, and these mountains may not have even existed pre-flood. So uh, there's no reason to assume that Enoch would have had... Um, any knowledge of these mountains. Um, also, the opening verses of the Book of Watchers paraphrase the blessing of Moses in Deuteronomy 33 as, uh, 33, as well as one of Balaam's oracles in Numbers 24. So obviously these came way after Enoch, and, and Enoch, he's making use of these passages. He's making use of these um, uh, oracles and paraphrasing them. And he makes use of a ton of scriptures throughout his writings. He appeals to the writings of Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and so on and so forth. And so obviously these writings came way after Enoch. Beyond that, uh, scholars can actually determine the historical setting of ancient writings by studying the material of these writings in light of other historical data. For example, the book, uh, the historical setting of the Book of Watchers, which is chapters 1 through 36 of First Enoch, is believed to be the Diadochian Wars, which occurred after Alexander the Great's death. Uh, in his book, Jewish Literature Between the Bible and the Mishnah, scholar George Nicholsberg actually writes this. He says, the large number of the Diadochi, the repeated campaigns in Palestine, and the multiplicity of wars and assassinations provide a suitable context for the descriptions of the battles of the giants, their devastation of the earth and humanity, and their destruction of one another. Within this context, the myth of supernatural procreation may be read as a parody of the claims of divine procreation attached to certain of the Diadochi. The author would be saying, yes, the parentage of the giants, quote-unquote, is supernatural, but their fathers are demons and rebels against heaven. So to put it simply, the authors of First Enoch are responding to current events of their day. That's the point of apocalyptic literature, which is the literary genre of First Enoch. We see the same thing in Daniel. Apocalyptic literature is intended to unveil the evil behind worldly empires and events and, and, and all of the stuff that is taking place during the author's time. And, and so First Enoch is just a, is an example of that uh, as, as apocalyptic literature. So um, also, the parables of Enoch in chapter 56, it makes an explicit historical reference to the Parthians and the Medes as an instrument of destruction against the land. And this is interesting uh, because it like, according to scholars, this this specific reference to the Parthians and the Medes actually likely refers to the invasion in 40 BC, just before the beginning of the, the reign of Herod the Great. So that's an explicit historical reference in First Enoch that gives us uh, a clue as to when this was composed. 
Also, uh, scholars believe that the Enochic calendar outlined in the Book of Luminaries, uh, within the Book of Enoch, uh, they actually borrowed elements from the Greek calendar as well as Greek arithmetic. And that would explain the reason behind the obsession with numerical symmetry and exact precision and regularity. So Enoch's calendar has marks of Greek influence. And that would, of course, indicate that the Book of Luminaries, which, by the way, is believed to be the oldest section of First Enoch, uh, that would indicate that it wasn't written or composed until after the conquests of Alexander the Great, which would explain these Greek uh, influences, um, uh, you know, that play a part uh, in the calendar. Okay, so having said all of that, what is the book of First Enoch then? If it wasn't written by Enoch of the Bible, it was written much later, what is it? Well, to put it simply... First Enoch is known as pseudepigrapha, meaning literature that is falsely attributed to a figure in the past, in this case, the patriarch Enoch. And this, by the way, was a very common type of Jewish literature in the Second Temple era. It's among many other similar Jewish writings composed between 200 BC to 200 AD. Now, the fact that First Enoch is pseudepigrapha does not make it worthless. As I mentioned earlier, First Enoch is still a valuable primary source if you want to learn about the social history, the beliefs, and the internal debates between the different Judaisms of that period. First Enoch can be very valuable, but only if we appreciate it for what it is. When we make it out to be more than what it is, that's when we fall into error, and that is what I think happens when we think of First Enoch as inspired scripture. Okay, so here are a few reasons that First Enoch should not be considered inspired scripture. Number one, the Messiah did not consider First Enoch to be inspired scripture. So everyone, if they are a follower of the Messiah, they should agree that the Messiah's definition of scripture is relevant to the question of whether we should consider First Enoch to be inspired scripture, right? Well, all of the evidence points to the fact that Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ, he did not consider First Enoch to be part of Scripture. Let me explain. The biblical canon of Yeshua's day uh, had a threefold division known as Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, that is uh, translated most often as the Law, Prophets, and the Writings. And this was and is the shape of the Old Testament canon of Scripture. That was the, the terminology that is used. Uh, it, it was known by the acronym, and it is known as the acronym Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. And the contents of this canon match the Old Testament canon of our Protestant Bibles today. This threefold canon is referenced not only in the New Testament, but also throughout other Jewish literature well before the time of Christ and after the time of Christ. For instance, Ben Sirah, who's the author of the apocryphal book, The Wisdom of Sirach, he had a grandson who translated his grandfather's writings into Greek around 130 BC. This translator, Ben Sirah's grandson, he wrote his own prologue to his translation, wherein he makes reference to this threefold shape of the Old Testament canon. And remarkably, the author actually distinguishes between his grandfather's writings, that is the wisdom of Sirach, the, the Jewish literature that we know as wisdom of Sirach, he makes a, distinct, uh, a distinction between those writings from the, uh, quote, the law itself and the prophecies and the rest of the books. That is, the law, prophets, and the writings. Okay, so here we see that by 130 BC, the books that are contained in this threefold canon were already widely considered to be uniquely sacred and distinct from any additional writings, including the apocryphal writings. So as far as we know, no manuscript or historical evidence indicates that pseudepigrapha, such as First Enoch, were ever accepted as part of this threefold canon of scripture. Neither the Greek Septuagint nor the Hebrew Masoretic texts include First Enoch in their sets. So it's not in the Septuagint, it's not in the Greek translation of uh, the 
uh, of the Old Testament, which predates Christ, by the way, and it's not in the Hebrew Masoretic text either. In fact, uh, in a passage from Against Apion 1.7, which was written in the 90s AD, the first century Jewish historian Josephus, he wrote that a defined Hebrew canon already existed by his time. And this confirmation from Josephus is remarkable for several reasons. First, he acknowledges that the threefold canon of the Hebrew Scriptures, which is the same threefold division that we find in the New Testament and other Jewish literature, uh, he, he makes direct reference to this threefold canon. Second, uh, Josephus limits the number of books to a specific number, 22. Five books, he says, are the books of Moses, 13 are the prophets, and the remaining four, he says, are hymns to God and precepts for human life. So there you have that threefold division of the Hebrew Scriptures. And a quick side note, by the way, uh, the Jewish canon today has 24 books, which matches the contents of our Protestant canon of 39 books. The reason for the difference in number is that the Jewish canon combines books that are separated in the Protestant canon. For example, in the Jewish canon, all the minor prophets are combined into one book. First and Second Kings are combined into one book. First and Second Chronicles are combined into one book, and, and so on and so forth. But the point is that the contents of both the Jewish canon and the Protestant canon uh, of the Old Testament are exactly the same. Josephus's canon is believed to have also combined Ruth with Judges in Lamentations with Jeremiah, which are separated in the current Jewish canon, which gives us a 22-book canon. In either case, we know that First Enoch was not part of this 22-book, three-fold canon, and Josephus's canon is believed to have been in place for at least 300 years prior to his writing. So the evidence that we have from primary Jewish sources confirms that the biblical canon during Yeshua's day excluded First Enoch. Why is this important? Why does the Jewish canon matter? It's important because Yeshua, as the Messiah and the eternal Son of God, he fully affirmed the biblical canon of his day, defining it as scripture. This is what it says in Luke 23, starting in verse 44. Then he said to them, this is Yeshua talking, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So here Yeshua is making a direct reference to the established biblical canon using the same terminology that is used throughout Jewish literature. Our Messiah endorsed the threefold biblical canon, which, according to primary evidence, excluded first Enoch. This was our Messiah's definition of the scriptures. Therefore, first Enoch is excluded from Yeshua, the Messiah's definition of inspired scripture. Now, further evidence is seen in Matthew 23, 35, when Yeshua speaks of all the righteous blood being poured out on, religious, on the religious leaders of his day, quote, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. Scholar Roger Beckwith writes this in his book. He says, in all probability, this implies that for Jesus and his hearers, the canon began with Genesis and ended with Chronicles, seeing that the murder of Abel is recorded near the beginning of the former book and the murder of Zechariah near the end of the latter book. This appears to reflect the traditional Jewish arrangement of the books. So this evidence would suggest that the Hebrew canon uh, was already established and closed by the time of Yeshua. And between at least 130 BC to the 90s AD, there's no indication that first Enoch was ever considered to be part of this canon. So since we know what writings the Jews considered canonical, and we know that Yeshua referred to those writings using the standard Jewish terminology of the canon without ever disputing the contents, we have every reason to conclude that Yeshua was in complete agreement with the Judaisms of his day in regard to the extent of the canon. And even people, by the way, who believe that First Enoch should be considered scripture, they agree that First Enoch was never considered part of the Jewish canon. 
uh, in, in the debate that I had, my opponent, he agreed with me that uh, First Enoch was never part of their canon. Well, here we have First uh, Yeshua using the same exact terminology for the Hebrew canon, affirming that as scripture, and there's no indication that he ever disagreed with the other Jews of his day with regard to the extent of that canon. And that's a pretty uh, significant point. So since Yeshua fully affirmed the biblical canon as scripture, his definition of scripture must be within the framework of that canon, and that canon excludes First Enoch. My second argument is that the teaching contained in First Enoch is in direct conflict with the teaching contained in scripture. So I'll give a few examples of this. First, and most significantly, First Enoch, at least as we have it today, teaches a false messiah. According to the parables of Enoch, which is chapters 37 through 71, Enoch is, according to the narrative, according to the story, he is taken into, the hev uh, into heaven where he is shown prophetic visions concerning a future messianic figure. Everyone agrees with this, okay? And this messianic figure goes by several titles, son of man, chosen one, anointed one, and righteous one. These are all names that are given to this messianic figure. And the author of the parables of Enoch, he writes about how this messianic figure, he's going to fulfill all of these prophecies that we find in books like Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, etc. So, for instance... In 1 Enoch 44, we see that this messianic son of man figure, he will sit on a throne of glory and execute judgment on the wicked. Chapter 48 of 1 Enoch describes how this figure will be a light to the nations, as Isaiah talks about. It goes on to say that all who dwell on the earth will worship this messianic figure and that the righteous will have salvation in his name. Chapter 69 talks about how this messianic figure will usher in a time of peace for the people of the earth, the righteous people of the earth. And then at the end of the parables of Enoch, we encounter an interesting passage. Enoch is taken to the, quote, heaven of heavens, where he is greeted by God himself and the archangels. And it is here where we, it is here where we learn the identity of this son of man that Enoch has been seeing in his visions. We are told clearly who the author of the parables of Enoch thinks the Messiah is. And drumroll please, it ain't Jesus. According to the book of Enoch, the Messiah is not Yeshua or Jesus. This is what it says in 1 Enoch chapter 71 beginning in verse 13. It says, and this is Enoch speaking, And the head of days came with Michael and Raphael and Gabriel and Phanuel and thousands and tens of thousands of angels without number. And he came to me and greeted me with his voice and said to me, You are that son of man who was born for righteousness, and righteousness dwells on you, and the righteousness of the head of days will not forsake you. Okay, so here Enoch is identified as the very messianic figure that he had seen in his visions. Earlier, in 1 Enoch 46, the messianic son of man is described in these exact same terms. Righteousness dwells with him, and he's born for it, and so forth, okay? So Enoch, he's called the son of man, and he is described with the exact same attributes that are applied to the son of man of his visions from earlier. Now, obviously, this puts the teaching of First Enoch in direct conflict with the teaching of the New Testament. In the New Testament, Yeshua, Jesus, he is the messianic son of man. He's the one who fulfills biblical prophecy. He's the one who will rule the world, usher in a time of peace, sit on God's throne, judge, and receive worship in the world to come. So, since Enoch and Yeshua can't both be the Messiah... The teaching of 1st Enoch in this regard is in direct conflict with the Bible. Now, to be fair, and I actually wrote an article on this, and you can read it. There's a link in the description. It's called, Who is the Son of Man in 1st Enoch 7114. But there is a 1912 translation of 1st Enoch from a scholar uh, named R.H. Charles, 
And he has this verse identifying the Son of Man in the third person rather than the second person, so that it reads, this is the Son of Man. And that, of course, uh, according to this translation, would imply that Enoch is not the one being revealed as this figure, but he's being directed to a separate figure. However, Charles' translation of this verse is a known mistranslation. According to every scholar, every Enochic scholar, they acknowledge that Charles' translation is a mistranslation. Uh, it, it's a deliberate mistranslation. Charles was skeptical of the idea of Enoch being identified as the Son of Man, and he had reasons for that that he argued uh, for why he's skeptical of this idea. But basically, he deliberately amended the text in 1 Enoch 71.14 to the third person. The problem with that emendation is that there is no basis in the text itself to support it. Charles, uh, by the way, he further theorized that a lost passage revealed the Son of Man figure as someone other than Enoch. Then, based on this theory, he deliberately amended the Ethiopic text to reflect a third-person rendering rather than what the text actually says. Here's what a scholar Leslie Walk writes concerning R.H. Charles' translation of this verse. He says, quote, Charles' solution was to amend the text of 1 Enoch 71.14 to the third person instead of the second person. Thus, Charles read, This is the Son of Man, rather than, You are the Son of Man. Then he made the necessary changes in the rest of the text to bring it into harmony with the third person rendering. He also suggested that a paragraph which revealed the identity of the Son of Man has been lost, but this extensive emendation has no surviving textual basis in any of the manuscripts, and for this reason is to be rejected. So to put it simply, R.H. Charles' mistranslation of 1 Enoch 71.14 was driven by a personal bias and a baseless theory about a missing passage in the text. And for this reason, modern Enochic scholarship universally rejects Charles' translation of 1 Enoch 71.14. There's no evidence of this missing passage that R.H. Charles based his emendation of 71.14 on. So, therefore, we have every reason to reject Charles' mistranslation and accept the literal translation of what the verse actually says, which of course identifies Enoch as the Messianic Son of Man, and that puts the teaching of 1 Enoch in direct conflict with the teaching of the New Testament. Now my opponent in the debate, he actually responded to this point by saying that there is some secret Aramaic version that nobody has ever read, and that this Aramaic version might say something different in that verse. And it's true that the Ethiopic text that we have today likely was translated from Greek, which was translated from an Aramaic original. But no one, we, we, don't, we simply do not have any Aramaic uh, manuscripts of, of, of this portion of First Enoch. However, this argument is extremely odd. If you want to argue that First Enoch should be in the Bible, then you can't argue that some hypothetical version of First Enoch that nobody has ever read should be included in the Bible. No, you need to defend the verse from the version of Enoch that we actually have available. Unless you say that this book that you never read should be in the Bible. Is that your argument, that this book you've never read should be in the Bible? No, you need to actually defend the verse of the version we actually have. And all of the manuscripts that, that we have, uh, which are the Ethiopic manuscripts, they all attest to the fact that Enoch is identified as the Messianic Son of Man in 1 Enoch 71, 14. My opponent also argued that he thinks that th this verse doesn't fit with the rest of the book, and that's fine, you know, he can make that argument. But, but then he would conclude that he guessed that he guesses that this verse in 71.14 was added or changed, added later or, or changed. But if the version of 1 Enoch we have contains major contradictions with the Bible, then it can't be considered scripture. You're not making an argument for some hypothetical version of 1 Enoch that nobody has ever read. You're saying that 1 Enoch, as we have it today, should be in the Bible. But 
the first the version of First Enoch that we have contains contradictions with the Bible. So how do you deal with that? In either case, um, Enochic scholars have argued that Enoch's identification, even even for example, if you say uh, like he does, that that doesn't fit with the narrative, Enoch's identification with the Son of Man doesn't fit with the narrative. That's fine. You can say that, but there are good arguments for why it does actually fit with the narrative. And Enochic scholars have actually argued that Enoch's identification as the Son of Man makes perfect sense in light of the flow of the, neighbor, uh, the narrative. It's the logical conclusion of the entire story. It's the climax of the story. And uh, Enoch being revealed as just a Son of Man uh, is anticlimactic. It, it doesn't make sense. Um, and, and this is, again, assuming that uh, the version that we have, you know, reflects what the original says. And, and, you know, that's all that we have, so that's all that we have to go off of. And anyway, uh, if you want more detail on this topic, again, see the article that I wrote, Who is the Son of Man in First Enoch 71.14, for more information on that. But anyway, let's keep going. In addition to presenting a false messiah, uh, some other conflicts in First Enoch include a negative view of the Jerusalem temple service. And uh, some scholars, for example, like George Nicholsberg, they've argued that the story of the Watchers in First Enoch was intended as an allegorical rebuke of the Jerusalem temple service in, in the Second Temple era. And uh, they believe in First Enoch, it's presented as being polluted and illegitimate in the minds of the author. In First Enoch chapters 89 through 90, the post-exilic temple service is criticized as being illegitimate. So, interestingly, the Dead Sea Scroll community, which likely came from the very proto-Essene movement out of which the Enochic writings originated, they likewise despised the Jerusalem Temple service and saw their own community as the proper substitute to the Temple service. Now, in contrast to this, Yeshua participated in the Temple service. He referred to the Temple as his Father's house. He commanded people he healed to make offerings at the temple as we see in the Gospels. And the apostles continued to participate in the temple services throughout the book of Acts. Also, uh, 1 Enoch chapter 71-82 through 82, give a detailed outline of a numerically symmetrical calendar revealed to Enoch by the angel Uriel. But this calendar is not the same as what the Torah teaches. Uh, the Torah presents a calendar which operates by observation rather than precise calculation, uh, as what is described in the book of Enoch. Uh, Yeshua and the apostles, they certainly would not have followed the calendar outlined in 1st Enoch. They followed the same calendar as what the Torah teaches, what the rest of Israel of their time followed, which was based on the sighting of the moon, as well as the barley harvest, again, based on observation rather than calculation. So, there are various other conflicts, in addition to some pretty fanciful material in First Enoch. For instance, some translations of First Enoch 7 teach that the giants grew to about four to 5,000 feet tall, which obviously doesn't match what the Bible teaches. Uh, biblical references to the sizes of these giants range from 9 feet tall to 15 feet tall. There are other translations of 1st Enoch that say the giants were about 450 feet tall, but again, that doesn't match what the Bible teaches. My opponent in the debate that I participated in, he, he actually didn't believe me when I said that some translations of 1st Enoch read that the giants were four to 5,000 feet tall. But here's what the R.H. Charles translation reads. It says in 1st Enoch 7-2, and they, talking about the human women, became pregnant, and they bare great giants, whose height was 3,000 L's. Now, the ancient L was the same as a cubit, which is approximately 18 inches. So if we go by that measurement, 3,000 L's are equal to 4,500 feet. So that that's just what it says. Uh, and, uh, you know, my opponent in the debate, he relied on R.H. Charles' translation. Um, and, you know, that's one of the translations. That's what it says. And other translations say, while they won't go, they won't go so far as to say 
4,500 feet. Uh, some other translations do say 450 feet. That's still not what the Bible teaches. So that's a conflict that, that needs to be reconciled. And, you know, we need to go by... We need to go by what the scripture says. That is our standard. Even, even the people that, that believe that First Enoch should be considered inspired scripture, it needs to be judged against the standard of the canon that we have, the standard of inspired scripture that we have, not the other way around. And if it doesn't match, then, you know, it doesn't match. The third argument that I have is that Jews and Christians have nearly universally rejected First Enoch as scripture. This includes the smaller Jewish communities in the first century that followed the Enochic writings. All right, so as we all already know, both Judaism and Christianity reject First Enoch as scripture. Historically, this has been the case. To be fair, there were a few church fathers, uh, in particular Tertullian, who challenged the majority view. And there have been other Christians throughout the centuries who've thought of First Enoch as scripture. But this view has always been in the extreme fringe minority. Now, some people might point to the Ethiopian church, which includes First Enoch in their canon, making it the only Christian community that does view First Enoch in such a high regard. And, you know, a lot of people ask, well, why does the Ethiopian church? Why do they include First Enoch in, as, in their canon if it's not scripture? But what a lot of people don't know, or they don't realize, because they haven't really looked into it, is that the Ethiopian church has a much more liberal and fluid concept of canon than the rest of Christianity. Daniel Asafa, who is a professor of scripture within the Ethiopian church tradition, this is what he says. He says, One can say that Enoch and Jubilees are in the canon, although we need to be careful in our use of the term canon. The concept of canon is not as rigid as in the West. You have various lists, and no one seems to be worried or to be preoccupied to have something definitive or normative. Emmanuel uh, Fritz, an expert on Ethiopian literature, he writes this. He says, My understanding is that there is no canon in the generally received sense. Rather, there are various codices, which include various books, not always the same, and the same names do not always indicate the same contents. It follows that I would not speak of a canon, but of lists of books, lists which do not point in themselves of the nature of the reception of the various writings listed. Okay, so in other words, there are multiple canons, so to speak, within the Ethiopic tradition, and not everyone agrees. It's very fluid, a very liberal and fluid concept of canon within the Ethiopic tradition. And while First Enoch is included in some canons of the Ethiopian church, it is excluded in others. For example, in 1983, the Ethiopian Orthodox Holy Synod produced a paper called quote, a short history, faith, and order of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And in this uh, paper, they provide a list of what they call the holy books of the Old Testament. First Enoch is not included in this list. So this is just another example of the fluidity and, and the, you know, the disagreements and, and the, the multiple canons within the church. So we can't really say we can't really appeal to the Ethiopian church and say, well, you know, they're, they have First Enoch included in their canon, so therefore some Christians consider it scripture. Not everyone agrees on the level of authority. In fact, not only is the Ethiopian canon fluid, but apparently not all the books that are included in their various canons hold the same level of authority. And this can perhaps be compared to how the Apocrypha is viewed within Eastern Orthodoxy. While it is part of their canon, it is generally considered to be of somewhat lower authority than the rest of the Bible. All right, but wait, there's more. Not even the Dead Sea Scroll community, whom we know highly valued First Enoch, considered it scripture. In his book, The Old Testament Canon of the New Testament Church, scholar Roger Beckwith demonstrates that the Essenes adhered to the three divisions of the canon and the standard count of the canonical books, the same as Yeshua and the other Judaisms of the Second Temple era. 
According to Beckwith, in their own writings, the Qumran community didn't treat the pseudepigrapha the same way they treated scripture. They referenced it differently and so forth. They didn't quote it as, as consistently or as often. And uh, another point is even though three of the books of First Enoch had been written by the time the Essenes split from the other Jewish communities in 152 BC, the Essenes never attempted to include the Enochic writings in their canon, but actually grouped the pseudepigrapha in a separate appendix indicating that these additional writings were not part of the canon as they saw it. In other words, they, they acknowledged that threefold division of the canon, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings, and the, the, the number of the books, the traditional numbering of the books, they agreed with Judaism about the shape of the canon. They used the same terminology, they agreed on the shape of the canon, and they are recorded historically as including pseudepigrapha in a separate appendix. They didn't try to stuff certain books from the pseudepigrapha, like First Enoch, into the prophets, for example. They included it in a separate appendix, which would entail that it was not part of the canon as they saw it. Qumran's view of First Enoch can be compared to uh, how some Orthodox Jews, for example, view Oral Torah. Uh, that is to say, they thought of the writings as being divinely, divinely revealed, but not on the same level as scripture. In their view, uh, like these writings like First Enoch, they were simply the correct interpretation of the scriptures, the same as oral Torah in Orthodox Judaism is the correct interpretation of the Torah. So, um, you know, for example, like some... Uh, in Orthodox Judaism, it's taught that at least portions of the Oral Torah were part of this unbroken chain of tradition going all the way back to Moses. It's the same idea with First Enoch in, in the Qumran community's tradition, that the, these are, you know, traditions or ideas that were revealed to Enoch and passed down from him, and, you know, therefore it's the correct interpretation, in their view, of the prophetic writings— but it's not on the same level as scripture. It's not, it doesn't hold that same level of authority as scripture. It's not part of the canon. So those who believe that first Enoch should be considered inspired scripture are in the extreme minority. That, that's basically the point there. Not even the Dead Sea Scroll community considered first Enoch scripture. And we know that they highly valued first Enoch and likely even came from the very proto-Essene movement out of which the Enochic writings originated. So if not even the very community that came from the community that wrote Enoch believed it to be scripture, the you know, it, why should we <laughs> consider it to be scripture if not even they considered it to be scripture? And and moreover, you know, they held to the, the canon, the same canon that the other Judaisms held to, the same canon that Yeshua affirmed and defined as scripture. So, in conclusion, to wrap up uh, at least my arguments here, Romans 3.2 says that God entrusted the Jews with the word of God, and the Jews knew which writings contained the words of God, and they did not consider First Enoch to be in that category. Never do we find any disagreement between Yeshua and the apostles and their Jewish opponents in regard to the extent of the canon. And as I've shown earlier, the Messiah and the apostles, they didn't consider First Enoch scripture as Messiah's view of scripture was in accordance with the Jewish view. It was in accordance with their canon. Okay? So while there are various similarities between First Enoch and the New Testament, that does not in itself necessarily prove that the New Testament authors were referencing or quoting First Enoch. To simply assert that the biblical authors directly quoted or referenced First Enoch based on similarities that might exist is to commit a questionable cause fallacy. Uh, just because there's similarities, it doesn't mean that one came from the other. All right. All that the similarities mean is that the that similar ideas and traditions existed and were discussed among the Judaisms of the first century. However. Even if the New Testament authors quoted First Enoch, like Jude possibly does, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, that still doesn't mean that they considered the material they quoted to be inspired scripture. 
Here's what Dr. Michael Heiser writes about this. He says, Just as preachers today quote commentaries, journals, news periodicals, or even television shows to drive home or illustrate a point, so the biblical writers used external material to draw attention and make a statement. Paul quotes from pagan Greek poets. The psalmists and prophets borrow vocabulary and paraphrase material from ancient Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and Syrian literature. Jude quotes a book from the Pseudepigrapha. The people of biblical times knew the quoted material wasn't inspired, but it had meaning for them and their audience. All right, so I could give many more reasons, but I think that these are sufficient to show that First Enoch should not be considered inspired scripture. And if anyone wants to convince you otherwise, they must address the fact that Yeshua's definition of scripture was in accordance with the biblical canon of his day which excluded First Enoch. They must reconcile all the conflicts between First Enoch and the Bible, including the fact that First Enoch teaches a false messiah, which is a pretty significant point, as we all would agree as Christians, I hope. Um, also, they must explain why their view of inspired scripture should be accepted over that of Judaism, Christianity, and even the very Jewish communities that produced and followed the Enochic writings. And... You know, I, I think that that is a pretty high hill to climb, but I welcome anyone to, to try to um, to try to climb it and, and to try to convince us otherwise, and, and I don't think anyone has. All right, but I do want to address a couple of points, um, and these are a couple of points that people often raise in support of the idea that First Enoch should be considered scripture. The first one comes from Matthew 22, uh, verses 23 through 32. This is a passage that a lot of people bring up because Yeshua makes reference to, quote, Scripture. And he accuses his opponents, the Sadducees, in this case, of not knowing Scripture. So he makes a direct reference to Scripture. And then what he does is he goes on to speak about an idea that is taught in First Enoch. Specifically, this idea that angels were not created to marry, that we're going to, uh, you know, that idea, that, that angels were not created to marry, okay? And that idea is talked about in First Enoch 15. So the argument is that, Enoch, uh, that Yeshua is alluding to First Enoch as scripture, and therefore, you know, since the Messiah alludes to First Enoch as scripture, it seems to be it seems to say that he's alluding to something that Enoch teaches, and it's right within, right after he talks about scripture, he accuses his opponents of not knowing scripture, so therefore we should consider it scripture. So let, let's go ahead and just read the passage real quick, and then we'll unpack this argument uh, and, and refute it. Matthew 22, starting in verse 23, The same day Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. But Jesus answered them, you are wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. All right, so basically what's going on here is that the Sadducees are trying to ask Yeshua a uh, trick question. To whom will this woman be married in the resurrection? Okay, it's a trick question. Why? Because the Sadducees rejected the resurrection, so their goal was to try to ridicule the idea of the resurrection in light of the Leverite marriage law in Deuteronomy 25. Which uh, and, and the reason they cite this law is because they thought that it created an impossible dilemma. You know, who if there is this such thing as this resurrection as you say... How, who's this woman going to be married to if she was married to all these men, all right? So they thought it created an impossible dilemma, and what Yeshua does is he responds by accusing the Sadducees of knowing neither the scriptures nor the power of God. So this is important, 
because first, Yeshua explains the nature of the resurrection, which addresses their dilemma about marriage. And then what he does is he gives a scriptural response to the fact of the resurrection. So he says, you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Then he talks about the nature of the resurrection in order to address their dilemma. And then he gives the scriptural argument uh, for the fact of the resurrection. So notice that Yeshua, in this very context, actually cites which scriptures he's referring to in verse 32. We read it earlier. And he quotes, not Enoch, he quotes Exodus 3, 6, when he says, uh, you know, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And the reason he quotes this is because while, while the Sadducees, they did uh, agree, you know, with the Jewish canon, uh, they thought of the Torah as, you know, uh, especially authoritative, okay? So, so it's not that they thought the rest of the scripture wasn't authoritative, they just thought of the Torah as especially authoritative. So Yeshua went straight to the Torah to establish his point. Okay, so he quotes Exodus 3.6, and therefore there's no reason to assume that he's alluding to First Enoch when he references scripture. The very context of the passage that he's referring to he cites which scriptures that he bases his argument on. So there's no reason to assume he's alluding to first Enoch there. Also, the idea of our resurrected bodies being like the angels isn't limited to first Enoch, but part of the broader Jewish debate concerning the nature of the resurrection. Second Baruch 51.10, for example, also makes reference to us being like angels in the resurrection, for instance. So this idea wasn't limited to first Enoch. There's no reason to assume that Yeshua was taking this idea from Enoch and, and saying that it's scriptures. And, and furthermore, there's no reason to assume that he's referencing it as scripture since he cites the very scriptures he's referring to in the direct context. Furthermore, we've already seen that Yeshua's definition of scripture was in accordance with the biblical canon of his day, which excluded first Enoch. And we see that in Luke 24 and also in Matthew 23. So again, there's no reason to assume he's referencing First Enoch as scripture. Another argument that people often bring up is in Jude, because Jude makes a direct reference to Enoch. And uh, Jude specifically beginning in verses 14 through 15. So this passage in Jude is said to come from two places in First Enoch. First Enoch 68 and First Enoch 1.9. And while many scholars, they believe that Jude was directly quoting First Enoch here, other scholars actually dispute this. For instance, Jude never mentions a book or a scroll of Enoch. He doesn't mention what is written, only what Enoch said. So some scholars argue that both Jude and the authors of this passage, uh, these passages in First Enoch, we're actually referencing the same source, perhaps an oral tradition going all the way back to what the actual Enoch said. We can speculate, you know. But in either case, it's possible that Jude wasn't relying on first Enoch at all when he said this. And it's likely that this tradition of Enoch prophesying coming judgment and all of that stuff, it, that this idea and this uh, content and this teaching this wasn't exclusive to First Enoch, but something that was discussed by various traditions at the time. So that's the first fold response, uh, the first of the twofold response to Jude's reference to Enoch, is that it's possible that he wasn't referencing Enoch at all, or the book of Enoch at all, um, but that both the author of First Enoch and Jude were referencing the same source. Um, there's no reason to assume that he's quoting first Enoch. However, even if we grant that, and this would be the second of my twofold response, even if Jude did directly quote from first Enoch, that would not entail that first Enoch is inspired or that it should be in the Bible. The biblical authors quoted plenty of material that nobody would consider inspired by God. Uh, again, this quote from Dr. Mike Heiser, I read it earlier, but I'll, I'll read it again because it speaks to this. 
He says, just as preachers today quote commentaries, journals, news periodicals, or even television shows to drive home or illustrate a point, so the biblical writers used external material to draw attention and make a statement. Paul quotes from pagan Greek poets. The psalmists and prophets borrow vocabulary and paraphrase material from ancient Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and Syrian literature. Jude quotes a book from the Pseudepigrapha. The people of biblical times knew the quoted material wasn't inspired, but it had meaning for them and their audience. So even if Jude did directly quote from the book of 1st Enoch, that would not entail that uh, what he quoted should be considered canonical or inspired, just as when Paul quotes pagan Greek poets. You know, we should not consider those poems to be part of scripture or to be inspired by God. All right. And so, you know, if that's uh, the basis of your argument for including first Enoch, then it, it's simply, it's simply uncompelling <laughs> to say the least. Uh, unless you are prepared to argue that all of the other stuff that is quoted in Scripture should also be included in the book of Enoch. Well, listen, I hope that this was uh, helpful to you. Uh, if you watched the debate that I had already, um, you know, a, a lot of this material you've heard already. You know, I just wanted to unpack a few of the points that I raised. Um but, you know, I, I hope it's helpful for you. And if you're not into debates, you know, maybe this, uh, you know, maybe this is refreshing and I, I went a little bit slower. So maybe you can digest the information a little bit better. In either case, uh, God bless you guys. Thank you for watching and reach out to me. Uh, subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Uh, send me an email. Go to my website. Um, I'd love to interact with you guys and answer your questions and talk about this topic a little bit more. Uh, like I said, I, I love this topic. It's incredibly fascinating to me. Um, and so I'd, I'd be happy to, to talk to you guys about it. But thank you again for watching. God bless you all. Um, I'll just bless you guys, and then we'll end it from here. Yevarechacha Adonai vaishmarecha. Yaer Adonai panavalecha vichunecha. Yisa Adonai panavalecha v'yasimlecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, and may he grant you his peace. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach, Sar HaShalom, in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. Take care.